Thomas Middleton, Shakespeare's contemporary, wrote a play set in Florence based on the life of the mistress of Francesco de' Medici. In its subplot, a woman named Livia acts as a go-between to help her brother seduce his own niece. In the main plot, Livia helps the Duke to seduce another man's wife by distracting her mother-in-law at a game of chess. All die by poison in the end. The play is called Women Beware Women. I mention that play mainly because of its title and because at least three of the misguided critics of Measure for Measure that I will quote this evening are women, whom you might have expected to defend the virtue of one of Shakespeare's greatest female characters, but who instead do their best to destroy her in our esteem. Sir Christopher Ricks has said that we literary critics make our living by quoting other critics and then refuting them. This evening I'm going to do my best to persuade both women and men in the audience to beware those critics, women and men, who, with poisoning speech, would seduce us away from our legitimate enjoyment of Shakespeare's true vision. Though some feminists would turn all women before 1968 into a species of persecuted men, and though some critics of Shakespeare would make of Isabel a prudish, heartless, sex-fearing problem, Shakespeare himself will show us how the civilization of men is preserved by the particular virtues of good women, and how the marriage of those virtues to the virtues of good men is vital to society and to the soul. I begin with an epigraph quoting the Duke in Measure for Measure. You will see its relevance when we get to the critics maligning of him too. O oh, place and greatness, millions of false eyes are stuck upon thee, volumes of report run with these false and most contrarious quest upon thy doings. Thousand escapes of wit make thee the father of their idle dream and rack thee in their fancies. The following is a sentence from a call for papers for a Shakespeare convention seminar on Measure for Measure. Quote, because of its ambiguities, Measure for Measure resists cohesive treatment. That's one of the women I'm going to quote. The assumption contained in this statement and the conclusion it comes to were seconded in some way by nearly all the participants in the seminar and seem to be almost universally subscribed to at the present time. Yet if the statement is true, the inevitable condition of the modern reader's, rel reader's relation to the play is antagonism. Our perception of ambiguity must interminably battle our longing for coherence in our minds and in countless published skirmishes, with no peace in sight. Some critics, like L.C. Knights, feel merely a, quote, discomfort in the play's ambiguities. Others, like Anne Barton, go so far in pursuing and identifying not only its ambiguities, but its difficulties, roughnesses, stylistic contrasts, illogicalities, obsessions, and savageries that even the vague hope for a unity produced by the play's, quote, non-cohesiveness is dashed and only confusion remains. Nor has the confusion been reduced by the more recent ideological and new historical criticism, which by focusing on elaborate discussions of Renaissance gender concepts or legal and social habits, have only exacerbated our experience of the incoherence of the play. Those of us who love the play and are moved by it again and again may therefore be justified in inquiring whether the apparent incoherence of the play is not traceable less 
to the play itself than to the perceptions of scholars, readers, and audiences. If it is, we ought properly to distinguish those conflicts that Measure for Measure actually dramatizes from the unwarranted conflicts between us and the play that arise from our own preconceptions. Perhaps when we recognize that the villain ambiguity lies in ourselves, the supposed ambiguity of the play will vanish, and peace between our perception of ambiguity and our longing for coherence between our imagination and Shakespeare's play will be restored. About Isabella at the end of the play, Barton writes, quote, Like Angelo, she has arrived at a new and juster knowledge of herself, and also by implication of a world of compromise and imperfection which has, at least to some extent, to be accepted on its own terms. This statement suggests that the ultimate knowledge to be gained in the play and in life is a provisional acceptance of compromise and imperfection, an attitude in keeping <clears throat> with Barton's view of the end of the play as a muddle of compromised principles, defeated intelligence, and clashing values. <clears throat> but reading the scene again, we are compelled to ask, is it not in Christian love, rather than in compromise, that Isabella kneels at the end? Surely her craving for justice for Angelo, a craving even the Duke pretends will not be altered, is converted not in the name of a provisional acceptance of imperfection, but in the name of mercy. The Duke himself uses the word about her kneeling. Isabella forgives Angelo, moved by his repentance, by Mariana's plea of love, and by recognition of her own significant, though innocent, part in his fall. And she is right to do so. It is the best gesture of one who all along has had spirit to do anything that appears not foul in the truth of my spirit. Angelo surrenders in the last scene, not merely because he has been caught. He recognizes his pride and destructive self-will as sin, honestly repents, and becomes for the first time capable of true justice in calling for the death penalty to be executed upon himself. I am sorry that such sorrow I procure, and so deep sticks it in my penitent heart that I crave death more willingly than mercy. Tis my deserving, and I do entreat it. His words here are neither ambiguous nor deceitful any more than are his confessions in the soliloquies of Act II. Nor is Shakespeare writing in careless haste, as Knights asserts, or succumbing to the pressure of comic form, as Barton claims. Shakespeare is providing rather a polished and morally serious resolution. Where before the seamer sacrificed justice to pursue his own corrupt will, now he is able to surrender his will and his very life in the name of justice. The Duke, whose goal all along has been not to study or torment, but to guide corrupt Vienna toward the true harmony of justice and mercy and of virtue and desire, at last succeeds. In the first scene, he lent Angelo our terror and our love. Mortality and mercy in Vienna live in thy tongue and heart. You can see the parallels. Terror goes with mortality and tongue, because a prince can say off with his head. And love goes with mercy and heart, which qualify the law. In the last scene, Isabella is called to enact the truth that in mercy that makes that in the mercy that makes justice possible, sorry, that in the mercy that justice makes possible, justice is fulfilled. Angelo is forced to learn that without mercy, a form of the love of others, justice is merely a disguise for pride. Both have been tested in the crucible of mortality through the false government of Vienna by Angelo and the false government of Angelo by his vice. Through a suffering not caused but overseen by the Duke, all have come to recognize and celebrate the mysterious but now revealed Christian truth 
that the source of both justice and mercy is love, under whose government their conflict is abolished. The end of the play thus enacts the psalmist's prophetic celebration of divine forgiveness. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Measure for measure, as Philip Thompson has said, is an ordinary Christian story. If these perceptions of the last scene are correct and exemplary, as more than one critic has argued, then the question the play actually raises is not what unity can there be in all this ambiguity, but what is it that causes so many of us to see ambiguity in this communion? What is wrong with our vision when in looking at mercy and repentance we can see only compromise and acceptance of imperfection? When, as Barton does, we call, quote, the probing deep into the dark places of society and the human mind realism, but the dramatization of sublime motions of the spirit mere fairy tale. The fault with our vision is the characteristically modern axiom of thought underlying it. That the world and all its inhabitants being accidental and meaning in life and in plays being merely a human product, meaning itself is accidental and therefore not truly meaningful. The bleakness of this pervasive axiom gives rise to the conviction that seeing through all pretensions to meaning is the only true seeing there is. That only the dark places of society and the human mind are true, and the light places, wherever they appear, must necessarily be illusions. This conviction, when it becomes a habit of mind, is known traditionally as despair. If there can be nothing but accidental meaning, then all claims for transcendent meaning must be false. If only misery is true, happiness must be suspect and happy endings hollow. Building on these unconscious assumptions, we then refuse to, or rather cannot, take seriously mercy in measure for measure. Before we ever experience its reality as it is revealed in the play, we are certain it must be a blatant fiction. The results are that we both fail to receive the play as it is and feel compelled to reinvent it according to the variety of our own conflicted images of reality while at the same time compelling Shakespeare against his will to validate the particular kind of misery and despair that is in fact ours alone. As F. R. Levis puts it, quote, Taking advantage of the distraction caused by the problems that propose themselves if one doesn't accept what measure for measure does offer, the bad prepotent tradition naturally tends to smuggle its irrelevancies into the vacancies one has created. The bad prepotent tradition is that which, quote, has placed measure for measure both among the unpleasant, cynical plays and among the unconscionable compromises of the artist with the botcher, the tragic poet with the slick provider of bespoke comedy. That incapacity for dealing with poetic drama, that innocence about the nature of convention and the conventional possibilities of Shakespearean dramatic method and form, which we associate with the name Bradley. That's the critic who took the plays uh, as realistic depictions of living characters and uh, mangled the intent of the plays by doing so. Much in Bradley is very valuable, but a lot of it is just off base. In this tradition, the happy ending is either denied, Isabella does not with a gesture accept the Duke's proposal, she may beg for Angelo's life but cannot truly forgive him, or defined out of existence. The author has weakly succumbed to the pressure of a fairy tale ending in place of what should have been a realistic one, in which presumably each character would be left with a grudge or dead. Isabella becomes a heartless prude, the Duke an arbitrary tyrant, Lucio and the Bauds exemplary exponents of teeming life, and Angelo every man only to the point where he repents, whereupon he is abandoned as one more fairy tale. 
It is certain that any hope for finding coherence in measure for measure within this tradition is doomed. For not only can Shakespeare not be both the authoritative dramatic genius we axi axiomatically take him to be and the botcher of measure for measure, but no play can possibly cohere for a reader who despairs of all unconflicted meaning. In fact, however, the common conclusion based, on, based upon all the supposed ambiguities that the shadow of the tragedies hangs over measure for measure is simply false. There is, first of all, no such shadow of the tragedies as the statement implies. The tragedies themselves reveal as much, containing not only a vision of evil and suffering, but also as thoroughgoing a vision of good, though presented under a different aspect, as that to be found in the comedies. It is true that the play is different in tone and mood from both a farcical comedy, like the Comedy of Errors, and from a love comedy, like As You Like It. The threat of death that hangs around the edges of those plays is at the center of this one. But it is not far in spirit from The Merchant of Venice or The Winter's Tale. At the same time, like them, though it is not at all bleak or conflicted as a whole, it does dramatize profound and potentially deadly conflicts, deadly to the soul as well as to the body. Angelo is torn between pride in his reputation and the lust that belies that reputation. He says, What's this? What's this? This is his soliloquy after he's met Isabel. Is this her fault or mine? The tempter or the tempted? Who sins most? Huh? Not she, nor doth she tempt. But it is I that, lying by the violet in the sun, do as the carrion does, not as the flower, corrupt with virtuous season. Can it be that modesty may more betray our sense than women's lightness? Having waste ground enough, shall we desire to raise the sanctuary and pitch our evils there? Oh, fie, 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 what dost thou, or what art thou, Angelo? Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good? Oh, let her brother live. Thieves for their robbery have authority when judges steal themselves. What, do I love her that I desire to hear her speak again and feast upon her eyes? What is it I dream on? O oh, cunning enemy, that to catch a saint with saints dost bait thy hook. Most dangerous is that temptation that doth goad us on to sin in loving virtue. Never could the strumpet with all her double vigor art and nature once stir my temper, but this virtuous maid subdues me quite. Ever till now, when men were fond, I smiled and wondered how. A few pages later, Heaven hath my empty words, whilst my invention, hearing not my tongue, anchors on Isabel. Heaven in my mouth, as I, if I did but only chew his name, and in my heart, the strong and swelling evil of my conception. The state wherein I studied is like a good thing being often read, grown seared and tedious. Yea, my gravity, wherein let no man hear me, I take pride. Could I with boot change for an idle plume which the air beats for vain? O oh, place, O oh, form, how often dost thou with thy case, thy habit, Wrench awe from fools, and tie wiser souls to thy false seeming. Blood, thou art blood. Let's write good angel on the devil's horn, tis not the devil's crest. He wants to have this reputation for perfection, and suddenly this lust is forcing him to realize that he is not what he thought he was. Since seeming virtue is no protection against real vice, Angelo soon travels the whole sinful route 
from false seeming through lechery, betrayal, murder, and perjury to become the embodiment of injustice. Only the Duke preserves him from doing real damage. The general discovery of his sin destroys his pride, for his reputation, wherein let no man hear me, I take pride, is exploded. He is then free to embrace true justice. For Claudio, the apparent conflict, whether or not to preserve his life at the expense of his sister's chastity, merely serves to reveal his real conflict between faith and despair, between love for Isabella and selfishness. This inner conflict is resolved in his acceptance of the Duke Friar's appropriately tuned advice, be absolute for death, a resolution from which he falls away momentarily only because of the false and falsely embraced hope constructed by Angelo's evil conditions. As we shall see, understanding the terms of this challenge to Claudio's virtue is essential to understanding Isabella's reaction. I'm going to read it in a moment. As for Isabella, she undergoes no moral conflict at all, in the sense of having to overcome any evil in herself, but rather suffers the challenge and the pain that come with consistently responding with complete virtue to the variety of evil conditions presented to her by Angelo's villainy and to the good that is brought out of them through the Duke's endeavors. In conversation with Angelo, she is the pure voice of reason, justice, truth, and mercy. Well, believe this, she says to Angelo, no ceremony that to great ones longs, not the king's crown, nor the deputed sword, the marshal's truncheon, nor the judge's robe, become them with one half so good a grace as mercy does. If he had been as you, and you as he, you would have slipped like him, but he, like you, would not have been so stern. He argues against it, saying he's setting an example. Isabella says, Could great men thunder as Jove himself does? Jove would never be quiet. For every pelting petty officer would use his heaven for thunder, nothing but thunder. Merciful heaven, thou rather with thy sharp and sulfurous bolt splits the unwedgeable and gnarled oak than the soft myrtle. But man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence, like an angry ape, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as makes the angels weep, who, with our spleens, would all themselves laugh mortal. Go to your bosom, she says to Angelo, knock there, and ask your heart what it doth know that's like my brother's fault. If it confess a natural guiltiness such as is his, let it not sound a thought upon your tongue against my brother's life. There we have tongue and heart again. In conversation with Claudio, Isabella is at first properly supportive of his virtuous resolution to die. There spake my brother. She is ready to sacrifice her life if doing so could save his, oh, were it but my life. And we are to believe her as Claudio himself does. She is compassionate, alas, alas, toward his fear, toward his fear of death, which, as the images he uses reveal, is really a fear of damnation, a form of despair, and Claudio's worst sin so far. So I want to read a little of this. Claudio, now, sister, what's the comfort? Isabella, why, as all comforts are, most good, most good indeed, Lord Angelo, having affairs to heaven, intends you for his swift ambassador. Tomorrow you set on. Is there no remedy? None but such remedy as to save a head, to cleave a heart in twain. But is there any? Yes, brother, you may live. 
There is a devilish mercy in the judge, if you'll implore it, that will free your life but fetter you till death. Let me know the point. I'm skipping a bit. Oh, I do fear thee, Claudio, and I quake, lest thou a feverous life shouldst entertain in six or seven winters more respect than a perpetual honor. Darest thou die? The sense of death is most in apprehension, and the poor beetle that we tread upon in corporal sufferance finds a pang as great as when a giant dies. Claudio says, don't embarrass me, of course I'll die if I have to. Yes, you must die. You, thou art too noble to conserve a life in base appliances. She tells him what the deal is. Yes, he would give it thee, that is your life, from this rank offense, so to offend him still. This night's the time that I should do what I abhor to name, or else thou diest tomorrow. Claudio, thou shalt not do it. Isabel, oh, were it but my life, I'd throw it down for your deliverance as frankly as a pin. Thanks, dear Isabel. Be ready, Claudio, for your death tomorrow. Yes. And then he says, has he affections in him that thus can make him bite the law by the nose when he would force it? Sure, it is no sin, or of the deadly seven it is the least. Isabella, which is the least? If it were damnable, he being so wise, why would he for the momentary trick be perdurably fined, meaning uh, forever damned? Oh, Isabel, what says my brother? Death is a fearful thing, Isabel, and shamed life a hateful. Aye, says Claudio, but to die and go we know not where, to lie in cold obstruction and to rot, this sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod, and the delighted spirit to bathe in fiery floods, or to reside in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about the pendant world, or to be worse than worst of those that lawless and in certain thought imagine howling. Tis too horrible. The weariest and most loathed worldly life that age, ache, penury and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death. Isabel, alas, alas, sweet sister, let me live. What sin you do to save a brother's life, nature dispenses with the deed so far that it becomes a virtue. Well, what has just happened? Claudio's in despair because he's imagining hell. All his images of being dead are not images of being in heaven, but images of being in hell. And that frightens him, and he becomes weak. And then his fear turns to reprehensible pleading. He becomes precisely a faithless coward and a dishonest wretch when his despair tempts him to implore his sister to sin for his sake. She properly resists with righteous anger. Her agreement to the bed trick later is in the circumstances exactly what the Duke calls it, an act of virtuous boldness. And her forgiveness of Angelo at the end is the crowning act of her goodness. Isabella's reaction to Claudio's pleading is perhaps more troublesome to the modern sensibility than anything else in the play. Here's what she says after he says, sweet sister, let me live. Oh, you beast! Oh, faithless coward! Oh, dishonest wretch! Wilt thou be made a man out of my vice? Is it not a kind of incest to take life from thine own sister's shame? What should I think? Heaven shield my mother played my father fair, for such a warped slip of wilderness ne'er issued from his blood. Take my defiance! Die! Perish, but bite my mut. Sorry, it's a great line. I just blew it. Might but by bending down reprieve thee from thy fate, it should proceed. I'll pray a thousand prayers for thy death, no word to save thee. Fie, 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 
thy sins not accidental but a trade. Mercy to thee would prove itself a bawd. Tis best thou diest quickly. And then the duke interrupts. Well, we are tempted to compare this outburst against him with the moment in Act 5 when she kneels to beg forgiveness for Angelo, and tempted to conclude that Isabel has been changed. She has grown, according to one interpretation, out of a selfish and prudish harshness into a newly acquired humility, or, according to another, out of an honest if distasteful sex revulsion into a fake and superficially comic coupling instinct. Even Robert G. Hunter, in his otherwise excellent discussion of the play, likens Isabella to Angelo and finds, quote, an armor of unyielding righteousness and an instinctive turning to death as a way out of life's difficulties behind Isabella's, quote, lack of charity in her harsh judgment of the human weakness of Claudio. He claims that Isabella's, quote, solution to the problem of Claudio's sinful weakness is his death. But to argue in these ways is to misunderstand what evokes the different reactions in Isabella. The contrast is not between a healthy and a sick, or an innocent and a guilty response to man's sinful nature. The true contrast is between the virtuous reaction to penitence and the equally virtuous reaction to threatening sin. For the Claudio that pleads for his life here, while he is very like the Angelo of the previous scene, is very unlike the Angelo Isabella forgives in Act 5. The difficulties of seeing Isabella's virtue at this moment are dispelled in Philip Thompson's discussion of the lines. Quote, Their meaning is an unexpected one. The statement is certainly opposed to charity, but you could say that in such a situation, an act of charity could be expected only of a saint. What some see in Claudio as only a natural weakness, Isabella feels as a mortal assault, and it is for this violent crime that she personally condemns him to death, as anyone but a saint would condemn to death his murderous assailant at the moment of attack. Claudio's crime here is like Angelo's in being the fruit of weakness, and it is as bad as Angelo's in its disregard of everything but the weakness inspiring it. To gain the power to repudiate his crime against her, his only sin, Claudio needed to feel the fury of her swift and devastating judgment, judgment itself. Her prayers for his death are prayers for his good death. Forgiveness of sin and judgment are not contraries. Reflecting, I forgive any man any sin against me, because I wish all sinners, every man, to overthrow the government of sin and to find the salvation established by divine forgiveness. Suffering at the hands of sin, I resist it with the judgment and the hope that the wages of sin is death. And Claudio concurs. We are not to judge Isabella by asking if her condemnation of Claudio is the becoming response of a loving sister to her desperate brother. When we rightly ask if it is the just response to what is a particularly craven form of personal injustice, we must be both morally and aesthetically blind if our demand for good feeling leads us to condemn a character whose feelings and moral sense are both outraged by Claudio's deadly, cowardly, and utterly selfish plea. And doesn't anyone notice that by afflicting him with justice, Isabella makes him a just man? When the play's action is concluded, ask Claudio if he resents his sister's passion for purity. Her fury saved Claudio from real corruption, and because of this spiritual regeneration, the saving of his life increases the virtue and the joy of a redeemed Vienna. His soul would have been lost if Isabella had not portrayed him to himself as a lost soul. Unquote. As judgment itself in the person of the Duke moves Angelo to repent in Act 5, so in the person of Isabella it moves Claudio here. It is Claudio, then, 
who has become for the moment an Angelo, Isabella, has not. The repentance comes after a few words with the Duke in disguise, and he says, Claudio says, let me ask my sister pardon. I am so out of love with life that I will sue to be rid of it. Two additional passages require specific mention, since together with her anger in response to Claudio's plea for life at the expense of her chastity, they constitute the only cause for the accusation made against Isabella, even by those who admit her fundamental goodness and her final forgiveness. They are her first words to the nun Francesca, wishing a more strict restraint upon the sisterhood, and Lucio's repeated exhortations to her to speak again and less tamely to Angelo in Act Two, Scene Two. To the nun, she says, and have you nuns no farther privileges? The nun says, are not these large enough? Isabella, yes, truly, I speak not as desiring more, but rather wishing a more strict restraint upon the sisterhood, the votarists of St. Clair. And then when she's speaking to Angelo, she is, her first reaction is, oh, just but severe law. She's about to accept it. And Lucio says, give not or so to him again, entreat him, kneel down before him, hang upon his gown, you are too cold. If you should need a pin, you could not with a more tame tongue desire it. To him, I say. And then she re renews her pleading. So Lucio's the one who has to sort of egg her on. Isabella is accused of a proud and uncompassionate moral rigor in wishing the most strict of the orders of nuns, the poor Clares, to be stricter still and, being, and in being willing to settle for Angelo's initial pronouncement without further resistance. Oh, just but severe law, I had a brother then. That's her first reaction to Angelo saying, no, he's going to die. But here's another example of the tendency to fill the space left by the rejection of what Shakespeare has given us with the problematic inventions of our own minds. Only one already doubtful that the desire for perfect strictness could be a sign of piety and devotion would read Isabella's first lines as other than a sign of just that. And those who can entertain the possibility of such a representation of piety, but reject that interpretation, are reading backward, looking at the introduction of Isabella through eyes already clouded by what the bad, bad prepotent tradition has had to say about Isabella's later actions. In other words, she's trying to escape a corrupt Vienna by going to the convent. There is no other out for her if she wants to live a chaste and virtuous life because G Vienna is in such a mess, Lucio representing it. So of course she wants strictness in the poor Clares. Likewise, that Isabella needs Lucio to prod her to defend her brother is not a sign of what Elsie Knights calls the frosty lack of sympathy of a self-regarding Puritanism, but rather a sign of her innocence of that morally corrupt an unredeemedly passionate world which has called her from the gates of a haven of holiness to do battle with it in the name of goodness. She does need prodding, not because of unfeeling detachment, but because of her unfamiliarity with and innocence of the powerful evil and rank injustice hidden behind the very authority she ought to be able to and does at first trust, namely Angelo. Isabella is not an unfeeling prude learning the riches of teeming life, but a lively innocent learning what our seamers be and confronting the cold hard fact of sin. Lucio knows better at this moment, not because he loves more compassionately, but because he is cynical about all authority, the Duke's as well as Angelo's, and seeks to preserve license against all preventions, tyrannical or just. And it is precisely because she does love her brother and distrusts the justice of the sentence upon him that Isabella puts off her meekness, responds to Lucio's encouragement, and confronts the authority of Angela. Finally, the Duke himself, like Isabella, is guiltless and exemplary and in no way internally conflicted, 
And like Isabella, he has been slandered by those who ought to know better than Lucio. That's the quote I read as the epigraph at the beginning. Under the burden of the bad prepotent tradition, even a critic who acknowledges that the Renaissance held ideal government to be an instance of imitatio dei, the imitation of God, <clears throat> and who observes the Duke's similarity to the absent testing master of the Gospel parables, can nonetheless accuse the Duke of spiritual usury, of cruel manipulation, and of a comically ironic failure to be God. Here's the third of the women that I'm quoting. Arguing that the play shows, quote, what a delicate balance exists between morality and the potent drives of unredeemed men, like Pompey and Barnardine, between the Duke's craft and Angelo's vice, Louise Schleiner, representing a very common point of view, asks, why must the play be either dark or sententious? And answers, in effect, that thanks to the magic of irony, it is really both, as if there were no third possibility. But to think of good and evil, of God's mercy and men's sins, as equal opposites, to settle for, quote, a comedy of a well-intentioned ruler with a rather quixotic notion of actually imitating the New Testament God in his government, unquote, is again to pretend that the incoherence we observe because of our own cynicism is in fact the coherence of a reductive Shakespearean irony. It is to get the illusions, but miss the point. The point is, that Renaissance sentences, as Renaissance audiences well knew, often contain not merely sententiousness, but truth. True to life, goodness in a dramatic character is not for them a contradiction in terms. Nor are they confused, as we often are, by the difference between personal intention and ceremonial correspondence in a fictional character. The Duke does not proudly think of himself as imitating God. Given his role as ruler, he quite properly knows that he bears the sword of heaven as the instrument of God's justice in Vienna. He is therefore meant to be seen by the audience not as presumptuously trying to be like God, but given his position and his moral character as analogous to God, like him tropically in Hamlet's meaning of the term. Nor does he manipulate the souls of Vienna in the name of some kind of egotistical divine usury. That's a quote from Schleiner. Here the critic gets even the allusion wrong. Rather, he leads them to become more worthy the creditor before whom all men are, as the Paternoster worded it in Shakespeare's day, debtors. Give us, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. His confession that he has been too lax in his government is not a dramatic complication to be pounced on as a sign of his dubious authority or inconstant nature. It is rather a revelation of his humility in taking upon himself the blame for other sins and of his magnanimity in resisting severity as long as possible. The critic continues to miss the point when she argues that the Duke, to be justified as a ruler and as a man, ought to be even more like God than he is, and that the play ought not to be called straightforwardly doctrinal, because it is unthinkable that one of the goats on Judgment Day would interrupt God with bawdy, self-serving interjections as Lucio interrupts the Duke in Act 5. Do you remember, as the Duke is trying to perform justice at the end, Lucio keeps interrupting with self-regarding jokes and putting himself forward. <clears throat> to argue thus is thoroughly to misunderstand both Christian doctrine and Shakespearean drama. It is to imagine that the former Christian doctrine is itself mere theater so irrelevant to life that the latter Shakespearean drama is doomed to choosing between it and truth. If doctrine is present, so the error inevitably, inevitably concludes, it can only be that Shakespeare means us to see it ironically. It is true, of course, that no ruler, no man, can transform the dark sinfulness of men. But the divine love can, as Shakespeare's audience believed, at least according to Shakespeare's drama, 
and it does so not by offering an unattainable ideal, but by working actively in the lives of men, inspiring just rulers and offering sinful villains opportunities for repentance. Nor does truth to life, as Shakespeare employs it, preclude the straightforwardly doctrinal representation of divinity thus working in the world. It is the very truth to life of that divine working of which Shakespeare wishes to provide a convincing image. To do so, he steers between our ideas of pure allegory and slice-of-life realism, combining poetic allusions to the rich complexity of Christian text and tradition with a dramatically convincing articulation of character. Only the conflicted modern sensibility will demand that Shakespeare confine himself to writing either medieval mystery plays or Ibsen. Only in a peculiarly modern species of religious ignorance, tinged with spiritual despair, will critics assume that doctrine and life are absolute contraries which can never coexist in the same play or in the same world unless irony wed them. Shakespeare did not assume so. And the Duke, like any other Shakespearean character rightly understood, is proof. He is a man moved by justice and mercy. And only thus does he stand in the microcosm of Vienna, poetically and dramatically, in a position corresponding to that of the divine source of justice and mercy in the macrocosm, the universe. The Duke, refers, sorry, the Duke defers telling Isabella that Claudio is alive, not in cruelty, but in goodness, for two complementary reasons. Here's what he says. Angelo has given the order for Claudio to be executed. Um, the Duke has arranged to send him the head of Ragazine, who died of a fever, instead, and keep Claudio alive. And then Isabella shows up in the prison, hoping to hear about the release of her brother, and is told that her brother, in fact, has been executed. And the Duke says, when Isabel shows up, she's come to know if yet her brother's pardon be come hither. This, by the way, is to the audience. Uh, we are the only ones that hear the Duke saying this. She's come to know if yet her brother's pardon be come hither. But I will keep her ignorant of her good, to make her heavenly comforts of despair when it is least expected. So, the Duke defers telling Isabella that Claudio is alive, not in cruelty, but in goodness for two complementary reasons. First, Claudio must be thought to be dead by all, including Isabella, if her own pleading for justice, Angelo's repentance, and the Duke's judgment are to have full force. Second, the Duke wants, just as he says, to make her heavenly comforts of despair when it is least expected. That is, to reward her, not merely with the life of her brother, but with his resurrection. Claudio's reappearance becomes, for the audience as well as for the characters, an image of all heaven's reunions, of the comfort that despair cannot imagine. Thus Shakespeare, so far from botching the play, or cheating us with an ironically employed theological pattern, that's a quote, is in fact demonstrating that not only sin, but its wages, death itself, can be transformed by God's grace, that all the trials of good men are at last redeemed in being revealed as mercy working for our good. Act 5 is not heaven debunked by the world, but heaven foretold in it. It is the slanderous, fantastic Lucio, benightedly imagining his prince to be no better than himself, who calls the Duke the old, fantastical Duke of dark corners. The audience, enlightened by the play, ought to see more clearly. The Duke only enters dark corners to bring light. Not to see this is to miss the whole dramatic point, to be guilty of studying to ironic, novelistic tatters what was written to be dramatically apprehended as deep 
and simple truth. One additional example of the supposed incoherence of the play lies in the apparent ambiguity of the Duke's attitude to unsanctified sexual union. He calls for Claudio and Juliet to confess the sin of their deed, and then arranges for Mariana to perform the same deed with Angelo. The ambiguity disappears, however, when we recognize that while the acts may be the same, their spiritual contents are opposite. The parallel is crafted precisely to dramatize that the real issue in both cases is the right relation of sexuality to sacrament. Let me read what the Duke says. He who the sword of heaven will bear should be as holy as severe, pattern in himself to know, grace to stand, and virtue go, more nor less to others paying than by self-offenses weighing. Shame to him whose cruel striking kills for faults of his own liking, twice treble shame on Angelo to weed my vice and let his grow. Oh, what may man within him hide, though angel on the outward side? Craft against vice I must apply. With Angelo tonight shall lie his old betrothed but despised. So disguise shall, by the disguised, pay with falsehood false exacting and perform an old contracting. Claudio and Angelo have both been guilty of divorcing the two, that is, sexuality and sacrament, and thereby of betraying each his betrothed, Claudio through his passion's impatience, and Angelo through his more vicious denial of love, one in the act of sexual union, the other in withholding himself from that union and from the consummation it enacts. The begetting of life and the consequent threat of death force Claudio and Juliet to recognize their sin and to repent. Angelo comes to recognition and repentance by finding that it is not, after all, Isabella, but Mariana who has satisfied his lust. That she has satisfied it is a demonstration to him and to us of the illusory nature of his compulsion to possess Isabella. Both Claudio and Angela have learned that the only worthy sexual love is that which is transfigured in sacramental union, and that only such love constitutes their true happiness. In the end, it is the rule of love in Vienna and within the human soul that resolves all the real conflicts in the play between justice and mercy, sexuality and sacrament, will and conscience, tongue and heart. And the resolution consists in the recognition that where love governs, there can be no conflict between these things. Two distincts, yes, but division none, in the words of Shakespeare's mystical poem, The Phoenix and the Turtle. This is why the pairings of the last scene are in no sense the theatrical disease that Anne Barton has accused them of being. Such an accusation can grow only out of an utter misreading of what has gone before, the sort of misreading that finds at the foundation of Isabella's character an irrational terror of sex. But Isabel has no such negative terror. She has rather a positive love of chastity which for Isabella, as for Shakespeare, includes both the virginity of the convent and the sacramental union of the marriage bed. It is not sex, but sin, that Isabel would shun, and not out of neurotic antipathy, but out of a true love of the good. Her movement toward marriage from the celibacy of the convent does parallel Angelo's movement toward it from his pretensions to icy virtue, but only in outward form. In spirit, they are dramatically complementary opposites. Hers is a progress to redeemed earthly love through all virtues. His is a progress to the same through sin and repentance. The marriages at the end are thus the appropriate symbols, the incarnations 
and the joyful rewards of the harmony of love. Isabella accepts the Duke's loving proposal, on stage must be shown to do so with a gesture, for it does import her good. Here are the Duke's two proposals. Claudio is revealed, and the Duke says to Isabel, If he be like your brother, for his sake is he pardoned, and for your lovely sake. Give me your hand and say you will be mine. He is my brother too. But fitter time for that. He postpones the formal proposal, and then at the very end he says, Dear Isabel, I have a motion much imports your good, whereto, if you'll a willing ear incline, what's mine is yours, and what is yours is mine. So he's proposing marriage to her. Now, of course, the modern corruptors have Isabel look at him, spit, and storm off the stage, or some version of that nonsense. Of course she accepts his proposal. They are of one mind. They are the two sides of the single coin. Angelo has received both mercy and his life, and will now properly value both because of Mariana. And because of her faithful love, and for the sake of their sworn, consummated, and now finally acknowledged, intended, and sanctified union, he, Angelo, will learn to forgive even himself, as the quickening of his eye suggests. The Duke notices his eye quickening at the end. These marriages are no more fairy tales in the critic's derogatory sense than Angelo's false seeming or Claudio's moment of despair. Nor does the, Duke influence, the Duke's influence on events bespeak chaos in heaven. Rather, the resolution of all the play's painful conflicts in sacramental marriage embodies and prefigures the harmony of heaven itself. There is no desperation and no confusion of values in the writing of Measure for Measure. The play is in fact a clarification of values, a demonstration of the truth that with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And let us be sure what this means in the play. Th this is where, of course, the title comes from, Measure for Measure. It's a quote from the book of Matthew. It is not merely an expression of the principle of an eye for an eye, whose apparent abrogation by the repentance and forgiveness in the last scene many critics find so hard to swallow. Rather, it means that as the measure of sin will be the measure of punishment, so the measure of repentance will be the measure of forgiveness. As justice will requite sin, so mercy will requite penitence. We may add, as ambiguity will requite doubt, so coherence, at least in Shakespeare, will requite faith. In the Gospel itself, it is not the plucking out of eyes that is being discussed, but the redeeming of their sight. Quote, Hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. In the recognition of one's own fallibility and the forgiveness of the others lies the harmonizing of justice and mercy. The duke and the friar, as the quick changes of the last scene impress upon us, are one. The duke, of course, the symbol of justice in the state. The friar is a member, uh, or pretending to be a member, of the order of the Franciscans, the um, devotees of the doctrine of love. Of course, it's the same person who keeps changing clothes. Justice, mercy, justice, mercy. <laughs> in seeing both the moat of Claudio's sin and the beam of Angelo's, the Duke is a representation of divine providence, as accusers and defenders of the play both claim but no more so than any fictional ruler who has succeeded in removing the beam from his own eye. And Isabel is a representation of the sanctified human soul, but no more so than any fictional heroine who always responds with the particular virtue called for by the moment. Think of Elizabeth Bennet in uh, Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. Her responses 
This Isabel's responses, meekness and boldness, argument and outrage, courage and patience, and finally forgiveness, all reveal a soul answering in right measure to the evil and good measures that confront her. She is an appropriate wife for the Duke, for they are of one mind in goodness. Thus, it is precisely the coherence of virtue that Shakespeare has made wonderfully visible in Measure for Measure, a coherence which the Duke and Isabel embody, which Claudio and Angelo learn, and in which, if we will only permit ourselves, we may in full measure rejoice. Thank you very much. All right, that was just over an hour, so let's take a five minute break and um, I'll get a drink of water and then I will take questions, comments, complaints, attacks, um, and, and um, apparent incoherencies and we'll see if, if I can resolve them. Um, when I first read what, what the Duke was doing, it called to mind um, Machiavelli in one of in the Prince. He talks about a prince who um, leaves not leaves the chastising of, of the town to to a very violent character and lets him do what he wants to, to get to, to ruthlessly stamp out the people and then and, and make sure that what he wants done is done. And then he comes back and kills the guy. Yes. Tortures the guy. Yeah. Now, um, so this obviously is not the, the Duke that, we, that we're talking about, but would Shakespeare have been informed by Yes. Machiavelli? He would have known the Machiavelli story and the point of view, which he did not approve of. Because the purpose of that, the, the Duke in that story, the purpose, his purpose is his own power and control and reputation and so on. There is a very close analogy to the Duke here because he cares about his reputation, he cares about his name, but not for his own sake. He cares about it because it is good for the state of Vienna to be um, obedient to, worshipful of, trusting in the Duke. The body politic is in good shape if people believe in their leader. If people are caviling at their leader or attacking him or maligning him or slandering him as Lucio does, the state is in trouble, is in danger. Just as the sexual sins in Vienna are rampant and they need to be reined in, so the sin of slandering the Duke in Lucio as the example is rampant and he needs to be threatened with punishment. But the purpose of getting people to stop slandering the Duke is ultimately not for the Duke's own ego gratification here. It is, it is for the good of all not just the Duke, but Vienna itself. So it is like, um, it is analogous to uh, slandering God. Who is, who is really being hurt, you know, if we go around, uh, go around accusing God and cursing? Well, we ourselves are. And of course, the society of which we are part. So it's analogous, it's the same kind of thing. The reason the Duke <clears throat> I mean, the, the, uh, the political tactic is the same. You get out of the way, let the bad cop do the dirty work, and then you come back and look like the good cop. And, but that can be done out of two different, completely different motives. And as we see, everything, part, uh, everything we see about this duke suggests that the motives are, f are to heal not only Vienna, but Angelo. You notice that when he comes back, he does not execute Angela. He redeems him. He gets him to confess and repent, and then he, re he forgives him his crimes um, and actually rewards him for that by marriage. And the same with Lucio, by the way. He, Lucio slanders the Duke and slanders the Duke all through the play, 
and at the end he is going to be sentenced to whipping and then hanging. And before he's whipped and hanged, he has to marry the whore that he got pregnant. So he complains. You know, marrying a punk is, is pressing to death, whipping and hanging. And the Duke says, slandering a prince deserves it. But then he goes on to say this, which most people ignore. He says, Lucio says, uh, I beseech your highness, do not marry me to a whore. Your highness said even now I made you a duke, because he pulled the cowl off of his head. Good my lord, do not recompense me in making me a cuckold. And the duke says, upon mine honor thou shalt marry her. Thy slanders I forgive, and therewithal remit thy other forfeits. Take him to prison, and see our pleasure here in executing. In other words, I forgive your slanders against me, I remove the other punishments you are going to suffer, pressing to death, whipping, hanging, but you are going to marry the whore. You're going to make an honest woman of her and an honest man of yourself. So even to Lucio, he's merciful, though, it, though he was personally attacked by him. I, I misunderstood that. There, there's a, a, an apocryphal saying that may or may, or may not be true, that one of uh, Eisenhower's um, cabinet members came to Eisenhower and said, they're giving me holy shirted hell about this policy. And Eisenhower said, better you than me. <laughs> but, but still, it seems as though he is abdicating part of his responsibility in not doing, in not being at least the firm guy. Because he's let, he's let the city go. Why has he? Because of too much mercy. Correct. So the whole play is about trying to bring those two opposite and apparently mutually exclusive values into harmony. Look, they are, uh, they are utter opposites, paradoxically opposites. If somebody comes before you guilty of a crime, you have two choices. You can punish him or you can let him off. And that's what he means by mortality and mercy in Vienna, live in thy tongue and heart. Well, if you're punishing him, you're not being merciful. And if you're letting him off, you're not being just. So how is it possible to be both merciful and just, which, is, which are both absolute values? We are called to be both. How do we do that? How does God do that? What, how is the world run with justice and mercy? Well, what's the relation between them? It's mysterious and invisible. And it's almost impossible in human judgments. We do it all the time, face it every day. You know, the kid plagiarizes on an essay for me, God forbid, or, um, or they're late to class, or they want to turn in a paper late, or something like that. And what do I do? I have to, I have to be just to some point. There have to be some consequences. Otherwise, you know, liberty plucks justice by the nose, and the thwart goes all decorum. On the other hand, I'm trying to teach them. I'm trying to help them grow up, and they're kids, and, and they're imperfect just like I am. And so I have to cut, some, cut them some slack, too. Well, when do I do it? You know, I do it up to a point, and then I say, that's it. <laughs> so he did that, too, for 14 years. Are you guys going to shape yourselves up or not? I'm, I'm warning you. Okay, it's, it's, it's going on. You see what's happening. Are you going to Okay, I'm out of here, and Angelo, now you have to face the music. But Angelo turns out to be a seamer, and that's the other side of the Duke's uh, disguise. That is, he's leaving Vienna to have Angelo put <laughs> Vienna back in shape in some way, but he's also doing it to test Angelo. This pure justice, who's the opposite of himself, uh, can he be merciful? And the answer is no until he falls to the same sin himself. And then he's caught, and then now we have this great harmony at the end of the play. And it's, it is, um, I remember my great teacher Mary Holmes said once, forgiveness is one of the hardest virtues to imagine, it's one of the hardest virtues to practice, even, even to think what it means to forgive is, impossible, but if you look at the painting of Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son, done very late in his life, 
and just look at the hands of the father on the back of the prodigal son, you will see the meaning of forgiveness. And Shakespeare has done, I think, here the same thing. Do you want to see how justice and mercy can be harmonized? Read the play. See this play. Believe it. Don't, don't come to it with the bad prepotent tradition in your mind. Come to it with simple Christian story. That's what it is. And now we get a vision of this harmony at the end of the play, and we, we get a sense of what it means. It's not justice without mercy, and it's not mercy without justice. It's marriage. Well, that's a not. Marriage is a not, says John Donne. You know, it's, it's an inextricable, mysterious combination of apparent opposites. And yet, there is no life without it. Likewise, there is no good life in a society without the marriage, the combination of justice and mercy. Yes? But to that, speaking of, you've talked um, about structure and how hierarchical structure is so important to Shakespeare. Yes. So we need to read all the plays with that in mind. Yes. So when that wraps up at the end, I mean, isn't that, I mean, we're balancing justice and mercy, but we need to do it within this very... So the, the, you're absolutely right, and the hierarchy is preserved by the wisdom of the Duke. He is the authority of Vienna, just as God is the authority of the universe. And it is his um, manipulation of things and, the, and our trust in that which rightly reorders Vienna. But at the end, he chooses Isabel to marry because she is uh, coming at the same ideal, that same harmony, from the other side, that is, from the feminine and from the merciful side. But she, at a moment, was justice when she yells at her brother. And he, at a moment, is mercy when he's doing all this for the sake of Mariana and, and, uh, and for the sake of Vienna. So, he, so within the hierarchy, there must be this harmony of absolutes. But in practical terms, the hierarchy is intact. It's not, it doesn't break the hierarchy for him to marry Isabella. It would break the hierarchy for him to marry Kate Keepdown. You know, the, the prostitute. It would break the hierarchy for, um, for him to allow Lucio uh, to get away with slandering the prince or the duke and, and to get Kate, keep down with child and not marry her because he wouldn't be fulfilling his authority. But it doesn't, it, it doesn't upend that hierarchy. It just brings it back into harmonious relation. Remember that what I said too, in terms of hierarchy, is that it's not just that the lower must be obedient to the higher, it's that the higher is responsible for the lower. That everyone has to fulfill their, their purpose. Correct. To buy into the whole structure so that everyone's doing what they need to do to keep the whole thing stable. Correct. Correct. And because uh, Claudio slept with Juliet before official marriage, he was breaching that harmony. Um, and Angelo breached it by promising to marry Mariana and then rejecting her. Why does he reject her? Do you remember the reason? Her, her dowry is lost at sea with her brother. And, okay, the money's not coming in? Forget you. He leaves her. Well, he falls in love with Isabella because she's good but he has become bad. So he sleeps with Mariana thinking it's Isabella, and that satisfies him. Um, and then he discovers what's happened, and he realizes, okay, his, his bread is really buttered on the side of marrying Mariana, who pleads for his life because she still loves him. I don't know why. <laughs> but she believes that he can be a good man. Best men are made out of faults, she says. And it turns out to be true. She turns out to be right. And it all works because the Duke 
knows it all, right, from the beginning. He knows what he's done, and he's, he's going to catch him. Other questions? One of the qualities you haven't mentioned about the Duke is his humility. He knows himself well enough to know that he has done wrong. Well, he doesn't actually call it wrong. No, but, but he, he screwed up, basically. Well, so let's not put it that way. I don't think he puts it that way. He said, yes, he does say, it was my fault to let them do this. It would be my cruelty to hold them up. But he also says, um, early on, when they want to escort him out of the city in the first scene. Um, they say, uh, give, us leave, give leave, my lord, that we may bring you something on the way, Angelo says. And the duke says, uh, no, no, my haste may not admit it. Of course, he wants to pretend to go and then go into hiding. But what he does say is, I love the people, but do not like to stage me to their eyes. Though it do well, I do not relish well their loud applause and aves vehement. Nor do I think the man of safe discretion that does affect it. That has the affection for it, affectation of it. So what he's saying is, uh, I'm not like you, Angelo. I don't need the people to be worshipping me every ten minutes to make me feel. In other words, there's no seeming in the Duke in that sense. <laughs> All seeming in the Duke is, is in service of the motive of doing good. Whereas for Angelo, it's a form of pride, right? W wanting the people to worship. So, so right from there, we see that the Duke is, uh, is not guilty of the kind of sin or opposite sin of Angelo. It's not like he's, it's a sin to have been merciful. It's just that he needs to counterbalance that. Because it's too much mercy, as Aeschylus says, mercy is not itself sometimes that seems so. You, you keep forgiving people, it just in, encourages them to do more wrong. So at some point, mercy requires some justice. It's really difficult for us to accept that a Shakespearean character can be good. It's just good, you know. He doesn't start out bad and become good. He doesn't start out good and then become bad and then become good. Some do, of course. But uh, an angel starts out seeming good but really bad and then gets worse and then repents. Like that we get. But for us to believe in the virtue of Isabella and the virtue of the Duke from the beginning all the way through, it's very difficult. We don't like to do that. We know we're not that good. And it's, we, we, we don't like anybody looking too good because it makes us feel inadequate and, and uh, faulty. And we are. But on the other hand, uh, sometimes it's very valuable to have the image of the ideal character to remind us what we should be. Even though we aren't it very often, uh, we need images of what we should be. And these critics that I'm trying to discredit here, um, would have us without any ideal characters. They would debunk and undermine the virtue of all the virtuous characters in Shakespeare, one by one, so that we must see them ironically, we must see them as false or self-deluded or something. Something's got to be wrong with them. And in that way they rob us of any images of real virtue, and then they wonder why they live in a society of people who are misbehaving all over the place. 50% divorce rate, out of wedlock, children all over, car uh, speeders and highway shootings, and not to mention Wall Street depredations, not to mention Washington. I mean, as Lewis says, we, we debunk courage and then complain that everyone around us is a coward. So I am trying to say, to argue here, that um, Shakespeare is not doing that. He is capable of giving us bad characters totally convincingly, but he's also capable of giving us good ones. And if we recognize that, we have a, 
a kind of wealth that uh, these poor critics don't have. Don't you think that Shakespeare's audience, though, had become accustomed to some degree of uh, character traits waxing and waning over the course of a story to where they would either start off good and become bad or the other way around? Of course, of course. Of course. Um, no, it's not unusual. Shakespeare does it a lot, but he doesn't do it with all his characters. And many, many times in, in the plays, many characters do change from beginning to end. They get better or they get worse. I mean, King Lear starts out, you know, a disaster. And he has to crawl through agonies back towards some kind of redemption by the end of the play, which he achieves. The whole play is about his transformation, his slow growth in, the, in spiritual recognition. Um, but Edgar is good all through the play. He's good at the beginning, he's good in the middle, he's good at the end. There's nothing wrong with Edgar. He has to lower himself to save himself, but he does nothing sinful. Um, Edmund is bad throughout the play until the last minute when he's on his deathbed, and he repents. Some good I mean to do, in despite of mine own nature. Which is a relief to us, because we like him, sort of, even though he's so awful. But um, uh, there are some characters that are just good. They don't do anything wrong. <laughs> in uh, Twelfth Night, the Duke is a sentimentalist. He's got to learn reality. Uh, Malvolio is a sentimentalist and proud, and he's got to learn reality. Olivia is a sentimentalist, and she's got to learn reality. But Viola and Sebastian, her brother, the twins that come from the outside, perfectly good when they get there and good all the way through. They do everything right, and they're totally lovable beginning to end. And as the situation changes, they have to adjust, but, but uh, it's never a moral transformation. Do you understand? So, yes, the audience was used to those transformations, but they also could recognize goodness when they saw it, presumably, and, and thorough badness. Iago is bad from beginning to end of Othello. It doesn't, doesn't change at all. Just more and more revelation of his villainy. We'll talk about that next week. Good. I enjoyed it particularly because it seems so modern in terms of political power. Absolutely right. It's because it's universal. You know, there's always somebody in power. Uh, whether he's been elected or not, and he, he uh, can make decisions that matter to people. And there's, of course, always somebody trying to, um, what we call, harass someone sexually in the workplace <laughs> or the law courts. There's a policeman just arrested last week for using his office to harass women that he, that he pretended to arrest and then wasn't really arrested. He got caught. He's, you could call him Angelo. Yeah, it's very topical. <laughs> was, was there anything political about this? This is just either before or after the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth. It's bef just before, I think. Um, I think that when you say political, everything he does is some way political in the sense that he is instructing the ruler how to be a ruler. Uh, and he's got some complaints about Queen Elizabeth. I mean, one, uh, one theory about the, um, the beloved of the sonnets is that he was arrested uh, by Elizabeth and thrown in jail for a while and then released when she died. And he writes a sonnet, possibly, about, you know, the moon has seen her eclipse, and now we're free. So he may have had some complaints about Elizabeth. But uh, while she was alive, first of all, it was forbidden to speak in public about the, um, the, uh, the um, question of inheritance of the throne. You couldn't, talk, you couldn't ask a question. You couldn't talk about it. 
if anybody heard you talking, saying, who's going to be the next monarch? Boom, you're in jail. So she didn't, she simply wanted that to be a non-issue. Um, and of course it was an issue, but not publicly talked about. So it was very dangerous to say something too pointedly political. But in the sense that uh, the play is seen as instructing any ruler how to rule, of course it's political. And people can apply it themselves as they wish uh, without Shakespeare having to come too close to danger by, by being specific. He's not being too particular. He's being rather particular in Henry V, but there he's praising Henry and uh, everything he's saying about the monarch is good. Uh, so it's, she's going to like it. <laughs> Do you want to know these people's names? The call for papers was Barbara Hodgden. And uh, Anne Barton writes the introduction in the Riverside Shakespeare, the collected Shakespeare published called the Riverside Shakespeare. She writes the introductions to all the comedies. They're so annoying. They're just in this way that I've been talking about, undermining all the comedy of the comedies. And then the last one was, um, was Louise Schleiner, Providential Improvisation in Measure for Measure. So she's the one that recognizes some of the biblical allusions, but then turns it all on its head as irony and so on. So those are the three women I'm, women against women. But um, there are plenty of men critics who, who uh, get it in one or another degree wrong, and there are plenty of directors who get it wrong. I mean, imagine robbing us, the audience, of the joy of Isabel marrying the Duke at the end of this play. A perfect match. And she spits in his face and storms off. You didn't tell me my brother was alive. How dare you? I'm out of here. Here, she's just seen her brother resurrected. You know, we're in heaven, potentially, and she spits at him and walks. So what does that tell us? It, it tells us that we don't care about justice and mercy. We don't care about the harmony of absolute values. We don't care about transcending the limitations of the self. We don't care about sacramental marriage. We just care about, you know, spitting in the face of anyone who's manipulated us. Since we see that kind of corruption or sexual harassment or you know all, all these terrible things in modern society, we ascribe our modern reactions to them. Yes, but what if I say that the multiplication of sexual harassment and such depravities is partly a function of our having been robbed of a, of a shared social ideal about the meaning of marriage? robbed of any idea of human beings except that they are depraved Darwinian animals fighting for survival. If that's our picture of society, why won't people commit sexual harassment all over the place? You see? And then we, then we perform this play. Because of good and evil and because we do have free will. And that's right. Yeah. And that's what the play is trying to tell us if we let it. <laughs> it's exactly the point. But if we mangle the play, then we're not reminded that we have free will and that it's about good and evil and justice and mercy. We're just left in a kind of Hobbesian universe of uh, every all against all. And, and then there's, there's no argument to be made to draw us out of that swamp. It's the swamp. So <laughs> here are these very, very fancy literary critics having these very uppity conventions on Shakespeare and thinking of themselves as really the aristocracy of uh, the American university and, and what they are promoting, realizing it or not, is the swamp. And uh, uh, squashing the voice of Shakespeare that's saying, no, 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 that's not what we are. There's more to us than that. Let's, come on, raise it up a bit. 
So my job, as I see it, is to restore that, our capacity to appreciate that in the play. Um, and, and I think it's there. I don't, I'm not making it up. I really think it's there, and I think it's in the language. And I think we have to betray the language in order to pretend that it isn't there. <laughs>